Welcome to another episode of the Hydro Dragster Experiment. So, it went out, it did a few passes and stuff. I'll post up one here for you guys to see. He's probably going to win. He'll win. He's, he's the one that built the two machines. Now, what was interesting about it was that at 150 feet, it was actually still accelerating. And it was at a point where the motor was just bogging down. So when you have these hydros, you have your input pulley here, and your input pulley spins like this, and your output spins to the side, and... What's happening is your input is torquing up your output onto that gear that we ended up installing. And we chose a gear that was just way too big. Um, it did not have enough takeoff torque, and so I blew it up. I, uh, I unloaded it. I wanted to see how fast it would go with me on it. I drove it down the driveway and did really good. Um, did a turn around at the neighbors and I got a little bit overzealous when I went for the second hit and I'm pretty sure we ate the pump right out of it. Now, Keep in mind, that transmission was also used for the experiment of running a 8-inch drive pulley on the engine to the stock pulley on the transmission. And so I already had that thing running at a 2 to 1, a little bit more excessive uh, input for over a year. We reground the top of the cylinders in order to be able to go drag racing that day. So... We're going to start with another transmission over again, and we're going to choose a gear ratio that's a little closer to a one-to-one -one gear ratio. We're going to see what we can fit in here out of the Spicer transmission we did last time and go from there. So, let's get this thing torn down and keep moving. So... One of the first things that you're going to end up running into here is you've got your quarter inch drain plug, which is right here. And this is the most slow and the most boring part of this is that what you need to do is you need to pull that plug. You need to tip this up on its side and you need to just let it sit there and drain for like two hours. This is not a fun thing. This is a boring go find something else to do for two hours. So the very first thing that we're going to do is take off all of this side panel stuff, take this out, tip it in order to go and dump out the fluid, and then walk away. All right. Most of this you're going to end up finding is either half inch or 7 16 and it should zip off pretty easily. This is what actually is in the Husqvarna setup that we're running, but... You need to save your running linkage for your particular tractor that you're putting it into. From what I've seen over the years, there's about six different variants of how this side is set up. So make sure you save the one for your tractor. All right. So this is the input linkage that goes to where your shifter is. What's interesting about these is they actually move the opposite of how you would expect it to. You would expect it to be forward going down and reverse going up, and it's the opposite. So plan ahead on that if you're making your own custom linkages. The first thing that you've got to do is take this brake assembly off, and that should be a 7 16 most likely. And actually, you can't even get... Well, yeah, 
Actually, what you need to do if you're going to break this case open first is get this diversion valve piece out. There's a diversion valve right there, and we're going to actually be eliminating that for the dragster anyway. And all you do is take this out, and once you get the transmission fully disassembled, you tap that out and you put a bolt in there and cut it off flush and call it good. But we need to get that off first. And that's just a flathead screwdriver and working our way around it till we finally get it off of there. And it, these are theoretically reusable, but I don't trust them to reuse. I replace them. There we go. Now this lever is keyed and will come off like so. And now we're going to go and take off the bolts for the brakes. There's one side. There's the other. Now, while we're in here, I wanted to point out when you pull this off, you want to make sure that you have your pad. And the most important part that everybody loses is this little itty bitty metal piece right here. If you lose that metal piece, these pistons push directly onto the pad and they'll shatter it. That's what this is for. So don't lose this. And if you do lose it, cut out a new one. Don't be lazy. The easiest thing to cut these out of is an old one of these. If I line it up, you can see it's almost exactly the same size. So if you end up losing one, an old saw. All right, so we'll set that aside. Now, what happens in this one, I'm gonna bet probably won't work, but I get a lot of questions about this. These are your pistons in here. And when this gets pushed back, it pivots and it pushes those pistons forward. And this one is locked up and it will not move. So what you wanna do is you wanna take this off and you want to set it in a vise and punch each one of those out very slowly and then sand them down, put some anti-seize on them and then put them back in place. So this is going to come off next. That's your brake rotor. And if it's rusted on the end of it, like this one is, you're going to need to just tap it with a flathead. And there it goes. And these brake rotors are different than on a geared transmission. If you look on the inside, you're going to see they are really large on the spline. Okay? And there is your other brake sh shoe pad, sorry, pad, not a shoe. It's a drum brake, it has shoes. These are rotors which have pads. All right, so from there, you're going to take this off. It's going to be spring-loaded, and it's going to have a certain amount of tension on it. And this decides exactly how fast this will move for you when you're pushing against it, okay? And you want to mark this off as to where it is that it's at. I don't have a marker on me right now, but normally what I would do is I would mark the upper part of the aluminum piece just to make sure I put it back in the same spot. Now, this is going to be a half of an inch. And there we go. So that'll have a washer, compression spring. Then you're going to have a cylinder, which goes down the center of your spring. A big solid washer. 
and then a little polymer washer. And you have to have this polymer washer, otherwise this will gouge into the metal washer and then seize in one direction or the other. You don't want that. So from here, we take off this. Now, I do not know why these are always so hard to remove, but that's a 200 foot-pound impact that I had to go back and forth several times to get it to come out. So expect it to be hard. So at this point, this piece pops off. Sometimes they're really hard to get off. Other times they just pop off really nice and easy. As you can see, it is obviously keyed. There's a square there. You really can't mess it up as to how it goes on because that has to line up with right here. That's it. That's the only way it goes on. You can't mess it up. Okay, so this is going to come off next. Now, we need to go and get that out because we need to be able to pull this. Alright, so this is going to be a T25. You want to remember that T25 because that's what the purge bottle also is or the overflow bottle or whatever you'd like to call it. The mounting screw for that is also a T25 Torx. So we're going to pop this off. And this really should just be hand tight. It shouldn't take hardly anything to go and take it out. Now, I don't know if we can catch it in camera, but you can see there's a wear mark there. So this piece here is wedged. I'll see if I can catch it. So you see that end is thin, that end is thick, okay? So that wedge rides on there to make a flat adjustment area, like so. So you've got this that it slides on, and then you got the other neoprene wa uh, nylon washer that it slides on. All right, let's play the what are the rest of them size game. This one here you're going to need a deep socket for. That deep socket is going to be a 9 16 in order to take that one out of there. The rest of all the rest of them are going to be 3 8 inch in order to go all the way out and around this thing once you drain it. While well, you're here right now, you might as well just take this one off anyway so that it's done and over with. Nothing's going to drain if you take it out. Up here for your adjuster, in order to remove this, you will need a 13 16 The one thing that I have found doing this in removing this is that if your socket has a lip like that, you might need a sacrificial socket that you can grind flat because there is not very much to get a hold of on that one. So we're going to pop this out. We're going to pop this out. We're going to take off our purge tank, and then we're going to start draining this thing. Now, as far as the purge tank is concerned, or the overflow tank, or whatever you want to call it, Basically, the way that this works is that this is your air vent. On the side here, 
you have a hose that comes out that drops down to the bottom of this. And we're going to take this Torx out that we were talking about before. Let me rotate that a little so you can see it. There we go. We've got a Torx right there that we got to take out. And yet again, that's that T25 thing we were talking about earlier. Now, both of the T25 screws that are used in these are exactly the same size. So it does not matter which order you put them back in or which one you use. This just pries off like so. Now, your tank, the reason why I have it like this is because it pulls kind of sideways like that. Now, when you pull it off, you got to watch for the hose, as you can see. There we are. And this should have had at least a little bit of fluid in it. And it doesn't. So this thing was already on the lower side of what it should have had. And that purge is clogged up anyway. So we're going to have to go and clean that out. So now from here we need to go and take this plug out and then we start draining it and you put this as high as possible and like I said you come back hours later for it to finally be done draining because it has to back drain through everything and even after you drain it there will still probably be about a half a quart in this thing when you go to take it apart. And there we go. Now we leave it like that for about two hours. Go do some laundry. Do the dishes you promised you were going to do. And all those other things in order to go and make your partner happy. And uh, then we come back. Uh, one quick thing about this. These are not put together with a pre-made gasket. They're done with RTV sealant. And so make sure that you have oil rated RTV sealant. For dealing with this before you break this down. I just use the black stuff. It seems to work perfectly fine on the few of these that I have done. But teach their own. We'll be back when this is done draining. In the future, in order to do these, I need to set myself up with a vise that is down about yay tall. In order to make these comfortable to work on. So at this point, I've gone through and taken all of the 3 8 bolts out all the way around and you got to make sure everything is out now when these come out they take the axle with them so you don't have to go and clean off the axle and a bunch of other stuff but if you're going to be setting on new tires and stuff like that these should be nice and clean anyway but it's not necessary unless you're trying to do this axle seal to clean this up at all. At this point, we're going to go around with a flathead screwdriver. There's a point here and there's a couple of other little divots you can find as you go around. It is not a gasket. It is gray RTV sealant that holds these together. So we're just going to pry it around. And bopping this with a rubber mallet as you try to bring it up is probably going to save you quite a, quite a bit of time. This one will usually come loose because as you can see it's all greasy anyway. And this one is just a straight shaft that should slide through. And for modifying for racing we're going to be removing this and putting a bolt here anyway. There we go. Just in case anybody didn't understand what I meant. See that right there starts your prying. And then once you get that up, you can take another flathead and you can get it underneath that lip right there in order to get around the outside edge to pop and then come back around to this edge over here. 
So the last time that we did this, we chose, I believe, fourth gear out of the spicer that we were working with. So here is the gear number set that we're working with this time. That is 3867 for this attempt. And so this is your stock. So this is what goes on your output shaft from your pump, uh, from your motor, hydraulic motor. So this is going to go right here. And this one is going to end up going right there. Get those lined up. Come on, work with me. So what we got to do is, if you look, you can see the wear mark right there. And that one's not worn in very much, which means this has low life on it, which is good. And what we're going to do is go over to a friend's and we're going to borrow his lathe. Now, you could do the same exact thing on a drill press. We're going to put a bolt through this. We're going to spin it in his lathe. We're going to take a grinder and we're going to grind it until this is a nice tight fit through there with a little bit extra. And then we're going to go back through. We're going to weld it up solid. We're going to weld this one onto here nice and solid. What I did the last time was I drove some very tiny nails into here around it in order to square this up to where it needed to be. And we'll go from there. This is less aggressive than what we tried before. The first attempt that we tried was more of a one-to-one -one ratio. This one is only a little bit above, well, it's, it's more than a little bit above stock, but should be about twice as fast. Maybe a little bit more. So there we go. We'll catch you on the flip side when we're ready to weld. Wanted to make sure to go and take a video so you guys can see exactly what it looks like before I start welding things up and before I end up making some sort of mess up. So at this point, this gear needs to be welded to this. And if we pull this off, you're going to see I've got a clip right there so that what I can do is get this centered tack welded a couple of times, pull the entire shaft and everything out, take the clip off so that I can weld the entire bottom and then grind it flat. And then on this one, see how that gear mesh meshes into there? I've actually got it upside down right now. So this side here with the cutout teeth area needs to actually go down and you weld up into it so that that way none of the weld comes up here where the teeth are going to hit. Otherwise, you have to grind into there to make it so that the teeth will clear. So while I'm here welding this up, I just wanted to go and point out one of my favorite little mobile welding tricks, which is one of these really, really cheap dollies that have the bars like that on the back because you can clamp stuff to it in order to work on it around wherever you need to be. Just a little helpful tip. Back to welding. We're at the point now that all the fitment is done. I'm about to start adding in the oil so when you've got it in a vise like this you can fill it with oil till a little bit below the line here. That way you don't have as much to go and fill in when you get this all put together. Because that is what you have to put oil in through when you're done with this. So the other thing I wanted to point out was yet again making sure that none of your welds come into here so that it clears. If you're attempting to check that stuff using your brake right here, if I can get whatever that is off, there we go. If you put your brake right on here, you can grab it with your palm and you can rotate everything to check your fitment and make sure everything is okay. 
So there we go. That all works. Now, I have chosen to remove my diversion valve out of this so that it's one less thing that can go wrong on race day. And I had a learning experience about this on the first one. So this is the gasket that goes right here. And I did the same thing to this one that I did the last one. I put a self-tapping screw into there in order to fill the hole. But what I did last time was I didn't remove that gasket. And the problem is that made it sit above this spot. And the shifter and the brake assembly, the brake rotor, sits right here. Let me grab it. The brake rotor was sitting right there, and as you can see, that goes across where the head of that bolt was. So I thought I'd be all brilliant, and I ground off the head of that bolt, except for what that did was it melted the rubber piece, and it, the self-tapping hadn't gone all the way through, so it started seeping. So that was my learning experience, was rip that seal out, and then put your bolt in there in order to seal everything up so at this point now we're gonna run a gasket bead across there with some rtv sealant and get this thing bolted back together just another quick little helpful tip you can tell whether your pump is actually functional right now because if i stick a finger in here and i start to swirl this you can actually see it starting to move the liquid around. See the different swirls coming through? It's rather hypnotic, actually. And I'm sure I'm going to get asked what I chose to run. It takes about three quarts to fill one of these. I chose to go with this. And... I'm sure that that probably is horrific overkill, but I figure since we're already overdoing the pulley on this and we're amping up that internal, that I might as well spend the extra for the hopes and giggles that it will last longer than the first attempt did. But then again, this transmission only has about 150, 160 hours on it, if I remember right. I think I said earlier in the video, and the one that I put in there the first time had like 300 hours, and I had been overdriving it with an 8-inch engine pulley for over a year and a half by the time I had built it. So this should be a good pump, a good hydraulic motor, and shouldn't be all worn out. So we'll see what we get out of it. A lot of you have asked what I ended up doing for a drive pulley, so, oh, great, magnetic. Ah, come back here. A lot of you have asked what I ended up doing for a drive pulley, so this is a standard stock Husqvarna AYP Craftsman style pulley, and these are about three and a half inches or so. This is the style of pulley that I usually put on most of my mud mowers. So what I do is I take this lower one and I cut the upper part of this pulley off and then I weld this down across the top of it to create this pulley like this for a mud mower, which is, you know, around five and a half inches on the outside, but the actual inner area that it spins on is about four and a half. So we can go from this to this for this next test because that was what I had on there, and it was a horrifically bad idea at seven inches wide. Now, in defense of this little 314, I ran that seven inch wide pulley to the stock pulley on the rear for almost a year doing 12 miles per hour at top speed, before that pump started to actually make any real noises. Now it did cavitate at about 10 miles per hour, but you could punch it to 12 for probably about 100 feet or so before it would start to cavitate. So we're gonna dial that back 
a little bit. And we're going to drop this one out. And here's the seal that I was talking about earlier in the video. As you can see, it ended up leaking because I cut it in order to make the brakes fit. And that just was a bad idea. If you're ever removing one of these, what you do is you pull the cotter pin, you take off the washer, you come around here, and you take a half inch wrench there and a half inch wrench there. You pull that out and pop that bolt through. You undo this half inch right here. You lower it down onto something, a block or a box or something. You undo both of these and then you undo the other side. Then you lift the rear end and you twist it that direction down and out. Well, I'm trying to sort out the belt to go on there. What do you guys think? Do you guys want to see me rip this open and do a diagnostics and show you the hydro cylinders and the pump cylinders to show you what happens when you overdrive them? Or are we just happy with the idea that it was a high hour transmission and it gave out. And as it is right now, when you have a hydro pump that's working correctly, you should be able to pull it over pretty decently with a couple of fingers. But I can feel certain sections where that almost takes a full hand. Yeah, see, it's all jerky. I can't get it to move correctly. So the cylinder is scoured. I don't know. Do you guys want me to tear it apart in a video and do some diagnostics? I mean, we know what's wrong with it, obviously, but if you want to see a video, post a comment down below. All right, so at this point, we've got the hydro in. We've got a 85-inch belt ended up being the correct one. And we're going to start it up. We're going to bring it down to an idle. And we're going to tune the hydro back and forth until it ends up clearing the air bubbles, which we learned in the last video. And then go from there. pounds heavier than Jesse does so when she's on here racing it should do even better uh, up on about two-thirds throttle it's no longer stalling out it's happy I've got to fix the exhaust and yeah we'll be good to go <laughs> 